Hi, I'm Malika Bilal and you're in the stream. Today we explore demands for the Israeli government to address the sharp rise in femicide and the U.S. government's decision to permit testing for fossil fuels along the Atlantic coastline, a move that could potentially endanger aquatic animals. But first, what did a Syrian man learn while stuck for seven months in a Malaysian airport? Leave your comments in the YouTube chat and listen to what refugee Hassan al Qantar said when he was finally able to leave that airport. Hi. I know I look like someone who ran from the Stone or Middle Ages. I'm sorry for that. I'm also sorry for not being in touch for the last uh, almost two months. For now, it's not important where I have been or what was going on with me. Uh, the bus is no longer with us. What is important uh, is today and tomorrow the present and the future. Well, for today, I am in uh, Taiwan International Airport. Uh, for tomorrow, I will be reaching my final destination, Vancouver, Canada. Uh, for the last eight years, it was hard, long uh, journey. And, uh, the last 10 months, it was very hard and cold. I could not do it without the support and the prayers from all of you. I could not do it without the help of uh, my family, my Canadian friends, family, and uh, my lawyer. Thank you all. Uh, I love you all. Uh, I will keep you updated. Let's keep the prayer for those who still need it the most uh, in refugee camps and detention camps all over the world. Hassan al Qantar had become resigned living in the domestic transfer lounge of the Kuala Lumpur International Airport after being deported from the United Arab Emirates and overstaying his Malaysian tourist visa. Unable to return to Syria due to the ongoing war, he documented life inside the terminal in a series of viral tweets, eventually attracting the attention of Canadian activist groups who organized to file a refugee application on his behalf. We're pleased to welcome Hassan al Qantar to the show from his new home in Whistler, British Columbia, Canada. Welcome to the stream, Hassan. I want to start here on my laptop with a tweet from Hassan himself. There is a will, there is a way. If there is a chance in a million to do something, anything, just do it. The result is breathtaking. Trust me. Canada is awesome. And a picture there of you. So I want to show you some of the reactions to your tweets from people just as happy that you made it to Canada. This is Ken who says, welcome to Canada, Hassan. Please don't hold our winters against us. Another person writes in, this is Sherry. She says, I'm very happy for you. Welcome to Canada. Vancouver and Whistler are awesome. They'll have you skiing and snowboarding soon. Hope you enjoy your new job at your your hotel in Whistler and best wishes. Hassan, talk to us about what it was like stepping foot in Vancouver, Canada after such a long journey. What was going through your mind? Thank you for having me, first of all. Uh, I realized for the first time that there is a moment in the real life, a rare moment, where it become more beautiful than the dream itself. Uh, breathtaking, uh, overwhelming. I. I can't believe how the people kind, generous they are. The minute I put foot on the, uh, Vancouver International Airport and how the immigration officers treated me, uh, I told them that uh, I have a bad experience when it comes to uh, dealing with, a with the immigration officers in both UAE and Malaysia, and you just uh, uh, changed my mind. Uh, I keep receiving uh, gifts and uh, free things from the co uh, community here. I got like 10 invitations for skiing with equipments as well. Um, invitation for dinner, for uh, going outside, for showing me around. Uh, it's, it's what I, uh, I could not imagine that it will be that, uh, that good and that beautiful. Uh, I feel really relaxed. I feel uh, I'm safe and legal finally. Mm. But I'm still thinking of those who left behind the people who are still suffering and how I'm uh, sh how should I be thankful and grateful for the rest of my life I, I'm actually much more luckier than uh, 65 million refugees in this world who are still suffering until the very moment. Mm. I want to share with our audience uh, someone who shares that sentiment that, of course, you're not alone, but she's also very happy that you are in Canada. This is Lori Cooper, one of the women and one of the people who helped sponsor your journey there. This is what she told the stream. When I first heard about Hassan, 
I really didn't know what to do. He was in a terrible situation. He couldn't leave the country. No airline would sell him an airline ticket. And uh, Malaysia wouldn't allow him to re-enter the country because he'd overstayed his visa. We um, eventually decided to raise the money to sponsor him. And with help from the Canadian government and UNHCR, we got him to Canada. But he's just one of over 68 million people who are displaced from their homes. And we, as a, and we need to find better ways as a society to support these people. Talk to us about how you came to be stranded in that airport. It's a long show, uh, story, but the short version of it, uh, it has a two faces, personal and uh, uh, general one, both will lead you to the same conclusion. Uh, I held a piece of document say that I born in Syria, and for that, for that only, the international community, the global system, since 2011 when the Syrian war start, are judging us because of it, not because of our own mistakes and crimes. Even it's, some airlines are not allowing us to board, even uh, we are not allowed to use uh, uh, Europe or certain airports in Europe uh, just because we are Syrian, even for a transit stop. It's hard. It's a new type of racism. It's a story of how the uh, global system has failed us and how individuals like uh, Lori Cooper or the a lawyer, uh, they can make a difference. They can change, change life uh, if they decided to. They are the real heroes here, and they are the real inspiration. I was a, a man with no choice, uh, but who decided to stand for his last battle, his main battle, and to ask what uh, I believe it's my human rights as a human being. Mm -hmm. And you uh, remained hopeful and, and, and did it in ways that look like this. I want to share with our audience. Uh, this is a tweet from Hassan's Twitter feed. Although I keep losing weight, I wanted to try my new treadmill, treadmill and doing some heavy exercises, trying to make use of available resources. Hashtag Syrian stuck at the airport. And you can see who there in this tweet doing, doing a few exercises there. So with that in mind, our audience has this question for you. Um, Yvette writes in, how did you remain hopeful under those circumstances? You're always a company by a smile that's right but there was also I'm still a human and there was a lot of uh, sad or down moments I uh, I did not share it uh, I thought that people in general they have their own lives they have their own problems they have their own tragedies they uh, uh, it's better to explain my situation not to complain about it better to deliver a statement with a smile uh, rather than an anger or uh, upset or depression so I decided to go with a smile and uh, I realized now life I can understand life from a different perspective uh, hope is the main source for everything a hopeless person cannot love cannot work cannot do anything cannot even w wake up in the morning give we need to understand that giving up is the result uh, not an option the result for uh, not trying enough uh, giving up so quickly it, uh, um, it's not like this. It's hard. It's lonely. It's cold. It's anger. But if we believe in it, we need to stand and uh, we will uh, reach a point when we be proud of what we are doing and love what we are doing, uh, regardless of the, the results. Mm. Hearing that story, we got this comment live on YouTube. Julie says, I hope one day that all oppressed people will feel this kind of freedom. How has your experience impacted your feelings about these kinds of restrictions on refugees? So in taking that, Hassan, what would your message be to an international audience watching you right now what you what would you want to say we are living in the future language we are speaking the future language now there is a power in the social media and the media itself uh, we don't they don't need to go out to protest with a the sign they can make a difference uh, while sitting in their living room by uh, sharing by commenting by uh, liking uh, something out of their principles they can make a difference and create the wave it's the moment when their rights will matching their duties. It's not only the, their right to speak uh, uh, freely or to express themselves. It's also their duties. There's uh, a lot of hostile environment in uh, the social media. They can make the change mm. uh, and right. they should do so. Uh, so the negative people will crawl back to their caves. And mm. there's a lot of love in this world. And uh, together we can fight. Uh, all the negativity, and we can make this world a better place for us and for the refugees as well. Hassan Al Qantar, perfect way to end this segment. Thank you for sharing your story with us Thank on you. the stream. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you.
We go now to Israel, where women throughout the country hit the streets on Tuesday, calling on Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and his government to address an uptick in femicide and domestic violence. Take a look at this video of the rally posted to Facebook by women's rights activist Sama Salemi. Sama joins us on the phone now. She's the founder and director of NAM, Arab Women in the Center. Also with us in Tel Aviv, Alison Summer is a journalist for the Israeli newspaper Haaretz. Welcome to both of you. I'll start here with a hashtag. It's in Hebrew, and it is all over Instagram right now. Uh, the hashtag uh, translates roughly to, I'm a woman, I'm on strike, and you can just scroll down and see the people who are posting this, their selfies, those at protests. Alison, talk to us about how this movement got started. What brought people to the streets? So actually, if you see the words uh, written on the people's palms, it says emergency situation or state of emergency. Um, the uh, strike and the demonstrations that took place on Tuesday were an outcry of uh, rage over the inaction of uh, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's government to the fact that uh, femicide, the number of women murdered by uh, domestic partners, by husbands, by close family members, jumped more than 30 percent in the last year. Last year it was 17, and this year, which isn't quite over yet, um, has been has risen to 24. And so part of the demonstrations was having 24 minutes of silence in memory of those women. And the outrage was uh, sparked, first of all, by the murder of two young girls, a 13-year-old and a 16-year-old, um, an Arab citizen of Israel and uh, a refugee asylum seeker from, uh, from Eritrea, um, who were both killed on the same day, which just happened to be the day after the uh, International Day recognizing uh, violence against women. And it was also a day uh, in the week that the government had rejected an earlier approved proposal to, um, to uh, give funds to fight this phenomenon. So it was really an, an outcry of uh, protest against the indifference by this government and a demand that the people in charge start taking this phenomenon seriously and address it as seriously as they, uh, as they take other security issues. Mm, I hear you there, Alison. I wanted to share this tweet we got from uh, someone whose handle is the syndicate. They say, if there has been a concrete accomplishment in Israel from the Me Too movement, it has been the demonstration of solidarity and caring that Israeli women have shown in their demand that the government mount a real battle against gender violence. Sama, I want to go to you with this because, as we all know, uh, too sadly, unfortunately, is that violence against women knows no bound, knows no race, religion, uh, culture. It happens everywhere. Talk to us about that idea of solidarity between women. First of all, thank you for um, approaching this uh, issue. Uh, we cannot ignore that 50% of the femicide victims inside the Israeli state are Palestinian women, the, and we are 20% of the population. That means that we are uh, more uh, as victims and uh, uh, being uh, Arab women in, inside the Israeli society is much, much dangerous than uh, Jewish women. The awful fact that uh, uh, 200,000 women are abused women in Israel, and the 30, 40% from them are Palestinian women also uh, um, pushed, uh, you know, the women to the street together uh, uh, last or two days ago. And um, under, under the state of Israel, which in you know, so-called democracy, we have this um, expectation that the uh, law and the law enforcement will take care or will uh, at least um, uh, be equal, you know, and to treat Arab women as and uh, Jewish women are victims of violence or domestic violence equally. But we see that 20 or 80% of the Arab 
perpetrators or killers are not behind bars. And 100% of the femicide cases against Jewish women are solved and someone is paying you know, a high price. Uh, so this is another kind of discrimination in the Israeli society, which has pushed us to translate our struggle as a feminist movement, as a Palestinian feminist movement inside the Israeli society. And in, uh, when this week it was too much to, to take from this chauvinist extremist um, government, mm-hmm. which uh, gave us slaps in the face and, and became, uh, as any extreme right-wing uh, government, right. uh, very, very violent. Violence against, mm-hmm. violence against uh, uh, the Arab and the Jewish women. So you've listed there what women are calling for and organizers are calling for. I wanted to share a few more demands this, uh, on Twitter. Uh, thank you for reaching out. Here are the changes we'd like. Domestic violence is not just physical. The government must provide financial support for women ex- experiencing domestic violence and address the wage gap. Another person writes in, this is Emily. She says, I think the government should immediately implement a $67 million plan that they planned 1.5 years ago and stalled. And I think there needs to be additional oversight to ensure police and other bodies adequately deal with this problem. Uh, But Alison, we know that uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu has come under fire. Why? Um, Well, because he is viewing uh, this through a political lens. I mean, he views most things through a political lens. But um, when he was asked visiting a women's shelter last week with his wife as to why he had um, led his government coalition to uh, reject a proposal to have a parliamentary committee in of inquiry into why this domestic violence was not being addressed adequately, uh, he answered that he had opposed it because the opposition had proposed it. And his wife, Sarah, who very rarely contradicts him uh, in public, uh, said this shouldn't be a question of opposition or coalition. She said this shouldn't be a political issue. It should be uh, beyond politics. And she, frankly, uh, appeared shocked that uh, that he had indeed uh, made this move. So. Um, uh, you know, most of most of his failings is that uh, is that he sees this as a quote unquote leftist issue, and uh, and his government is a, is a right wing government. But I think that the message has now been heard after the the massive protests that really had no po- political stripe on them, right or left. Women from the entire spectrum of Israeli society well, spoke out on I Tuesday. That, uh, so I think the, maybe the he's going to take some action. Struggle is political. There is no feminist struggle without uh, politics inside. It's uh, we are talking about about uh, power and the balance of the power and the, uh, the gap between the Jewish and the Palestinians and the authority. We, we are under this authority, under this government for decades, and, and it's going from, you know, gender issues and gender equality. Uh, we see what this government is doing. Right. And uh, besides, like, oppressing Palestinians, five million Palestinians behind the walls and in Gaza and the West Bank, and we see that what's happening in, with the Palestinian women inside. We cannot say that it is a social struggle. Any feminist uh, struggle is political struggle, and we have to put that on the table. And yes, it is a matter of opposition and coalition, because we saw what this coalition is doing right. for, for Sama, uh, gender Sama, equality, I have to pause for, you for there. minorities, for Sama, uh, I, ha- I have to pause figures. you there, unfortunately, because we're out of time for this, but I hear and take your point uh, that this, of course, is beyond politics. Mohammed here on YouTube says it's very sad news to lose 24 lives all in the name of domestic violence. So we'll pause this part of the conversation in Israel right now. Thank you to Samah Salemi and Allison Summer for being part of it. Finally, to the U.S. mid-Atlantic coastline and the debate around an offshore drilling policy that could potentially harm many marine species. Here's how one environmental rights group campaign is addressing the issue.
Now, last month, the Trump administration reversed an Obama-era measure that prohibited offshore drilling within 50 miles of the Atlantic coast. Oil and gas companies will now be able to use seismic air guns to test for fossil fuels, but a coalition of business owners, animal welfare activists, and politicians oppose the decision. Michael Jasny is the director for the Marine Mammal Protection Project at the Natural Resources Defense Council, and he joins us from New York. Welcome, Michael, to the stream. I want to start with Hi, this Malika. tweet. Hi there. This is from Molly, who says, it is so upsetting that seismic blasting uh, off of the coast got the green light. This will have serious impacts on marine life and the existing coastal community that depends on a healthy Atlantic. So we're definitely hearing from people who are opposed to this. But before we get too deep, explain to us in layman's terms, seismic blasting, what is it? And why do you find it so problematic? Sure. Well, first of all, make no mistake, what we're talking about here, seismic blasting, is the precursor to offshore drilling, and that has very significant impacts on the environment. But seismic blasting is something that has significant impacts in and of itself. In order to prospect for oil and gas miles beneath the seafloor, industry tows arrays of high-volume air guns behind vessels. Those air guns go off about every 10 seconds or so, night and day, for months on end. It's uh, just imagine having an explosive go off in your neighborhood every 10 seconds for months. And that is, is what uh, the oil and gas industry and the Trump administration want to subject uh, the marine environment off the East Coast, too. Mm. Well, speaking of the Trump administration, for this discussion, we reached out to get a comment from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. That's a U.S. government agency that's monitoring climate. And here's what they told us. We have also, while when under finalizing these authorizations, we've also carefully reviewed and ensured uh, appropriate use of best available information, best scientific information available in meeting the requirements of the MMPA, the Endangered Species Act, uh, National Environmental Policy Act, and other M implementing regulations for these geophysical surveys. Um, and um, with respect to the Endangered Species Act, we've ensured that the effects of the authorizations do not result in jeopardy um, of endangered or threatened species under the ESA, and uh, have prepared and signed a biological opinion documenting that analysis. So, Michael, it's a bit of alphabet soup there, but her point is that the government has heard these complaints, and they're making sure that they're doing things in compliance with laws. What do you make of that? Yeah, I mean, unfortunately, this administration isn't exactly long on science. And uh, this is another case in which they're just disregarding the basic facts about the activity that they're, uh, that they're authorizing. Uh, seismic surveys have an extraordinarily large environmental print, footprint. Uh, we know that uh, the, the blast that they emit can silence whales for hundreds of miles around uh, a single array. And what uh, they proposed here involves running some 70,000 miles of uh, air gun track line like a lawnmower back and forth mm. uh, 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 over the, the mid-Atlantic and, and, and southeast uh, uh, regions. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's what, what the uh, Trump administration is doing is it's like looking at a, at a taking a smokestack and looking for impacts just uh, uh, within a, a few meters when, in fact, uh, the pollution emitted by that smokestack goes out for miles and miles. That's their approach, and it, it, it's just completely out of scale uh, with uh, what the scientific community understands mm. to be the environmental impacts of the activity. So I want to present to our audience two opposing sides of this. This is Solo Cress who tweeted into the stream saying that the impact of this is making America great and creating millions of jobs. On the other side of that coin, we got a video comment from someone who stands opposite to that. This is Diane, and she is the campaign director for Oceana. Have a listen to what she had to say. This action flies in the face of massive opposition to offshore drilling and seismic air gun blasting, including over 90% of coastal municipalities in the blast zone. Fundamentally, if we go down this path, the Atlantic coast could be turned from beach towns to oil towns. The people have spoken. That's not what they want, or the harm that comes from seismic air gun blasting. Oceana is preparing to fight this, and a lawsuit is one tool we're considering. Michael, a lawsuit, do you think that's the way forward? Well, it, I think, as, as you just heard, it's, uh, it's, it's one tool that, that can be used to, to fight this. The fact is that 
uh, the administration has violated multiple laws uh, in, in approving this, this activity. Uh, and uh, whether it's uh, before the court or the court of public opinion, um, whether it's in coastal communities or in Capitol Hill, where the opposition to seismic blasting and offshore drilling is wide and deep and bipartisan, uh, we, are, we are going to, uh, to, to fight this action. Michael, I'll end here with this from t uh, Pete, who says the battle for the Atlantic is now in full swing. Go tell your representative. Let them know that giving our pristine coast to the oil industry is unacceptable. Thank you to Michael Jasney. That's all the time we have for right now. Be sure to keep tabs on the stories we discussed and the other stories we're following by following us at Twitter. We are at AJStream. We'll see you next time.